welcome to uh, High School Comedy's Facts and Trivia. Uh, it's kind of a downer today, but uh, it's always intrigued me, this story, and it kind of makes me mad at the end of it. But um, today's member, uh, String Bean, <clears throat> excuse me, from Hee Haw. Uh, my heart, my heart, my heart. <laughs> You'd always read them letters. Um, he was murdered uh, in the 1970s. Uh, and I want to let you know how it happened and, and what's going on now about it. And it's just, it, it went kind of crazy there at the end, but, um, as crazy as could be. Let's take a look. The circumstances surrounding the murders of David String Bean Aikman and his wife changed Nashville and country music forever. Uh, the singer banjo player and homespun humorist from Hee Haw was born in 1914. He married his wife, Estelle, in 1945, and he'd go on to become a star of the Grand Ole Opry in the 1950s, frequently performing with Grand Paul Jones, who was one of his closest friends and also his neighbor in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. The two men were part of the cast of the new country music sketch comedy television series, Hee Haw, beginning in 1969. Aikman and his wife lived modestly in a small cabin, but he was known to carry large amounts of cash since he did not trust banks after the Great Depression. According to the Nashville, Tennessean newspaper, their life out in the country was so idyllic that they told friends that they could leave a bucket of cash on the porch, go on tour, and return to find it still sitting there, which made the events of the night of November 10th, 1973, that much more shocking. Aikman and Estelle uh, returned home to their cabin that Saturday night after a routine performance at the Opry, and when they rolled up to the cabin, authorities believe Aikman noticed something was wrong with the porch. He approached the house alone, armed with a twenty-two pistol that he carried with him for protection. And when he went inside, two men were waiting for him. Twenty-three-year-old cousins, John Brown and Doug Brown, had already torn the cabin apart, searching for the money they had heard Aikman kept on hand. Doug Brown shot Aikman dead and then pursued Estelle, who had begun to run for the road and yell for help, out into the yard where he shot her in the back of the head. According to later testimony, she begged for mercy before he killed her. Trials would later reveal that the men's motive had been robbery, fueled by alcohol and drugs. They got away with just $250 that they found in Aikman's front overall pocket, Esther's purse, and a few guns. Driving the couple's station wagon, investigators would later find thousands of dollars in cash on the couple's bodies that the killers had missed, sewn into special pockets inside their clothing. Um, sorry. Uh, Grandpa Jones found the bodies the following morning. When he showed up at their cabin for a hunting trip he and Aikman had planned, uh, the brutal murders marked a turning point in Nashville's history. It was a subculture where everyone dealt in handshakes, promises, and word of mouth with no fear of betrayal. Prominent Nashville guitarist Steve Gibson, whose father, Kurt Gibson, performed with Aikman during the final Opry show, told the Tennessean, The best qualities of any small town really define Nashville as Music City. And with the violent, brutal murders of String Bean and Estelle, everyone had to rethink all that. We started looking over our shoulders and wondering what was happening. Our friends would recall them with love decades later. They were such sweet, gentle people, both of them, Grandpa Jones' wife, Ramona Jones, said. Sweet, gentle people that loved nature and spent most of their free time fishing on a creek. For a year, I couldn't hardly talk about it. It was devastating. Sad time. A trying time. I don't think you ever get over something like that. Our lives are never the same after that. In the 90s, two decades after the murder, several news organizations reported that $20,000 had been found behind a brick in the chimney of the Aikman's old fireplace, but it was too deteriorated to be usable. It's unclear if that story was ever verified. Both Brown cousins were sentenced to life in prison, and Doug Brown died behind bars in 2003. John Brown pleaded for forgiveness and logged a record of good behavior in the decades after the murders. And in 2014, despite a campaign from Opry stars Bill Anderson, Jan Howard, Gene Shepard, and Mac Wiseman for him to remain incarcerated, the Tennessee Board of Pro voted to free the then 64-year-old man. Speaking to the Tennessee and afterward, uh, Wiseman called it a great miscarriage of justice. It makes me question the legal system. I fully believe that the good Lord forgives us for our mistakes, Wiseman added, but the parole board members don't have the authority spiritually or otherwise to forgive that man, I don't think. Gene Shepard echoed that thought. Why should they turn him loose? He cold-bloodedly killed two friends of ours, she said. I'm sure the Lord will forgive him, but I don't think any of us will. Just blows my mind that the man got out. I mean, 
like they say, the Lord will forgive, but it just blows my mind that he got out on parole. Uh, it's a cold-blooded murder. I mean, it wasn't, it was calculated. It wasn't, you know, an accident. It wasn't, you know, this is just pure evil, pure evil. I don't even know what happened to the man now, but I didn't look it up, but I was too pissed off to to look up what was going on with, with him now, if he's even alive. Uh, but it's just a shame, a real shame. Uh, sweet, sweet couple. Uh, great comedian as well. He was in a banjo player, a great banjo player. He was like uh, Bill Monroe's uh, first banjo player uh, before uh, Flat and Scruggs come along to be in the band. Uh, so I'll tell you how talented he was. Anyway, that's all I got for you guys. Um, please don't forget to subscribe and please like this video. You guys have a great day. God bless you. Praying for you.